Uh, so thank you very much, Josh, for being with us. My pleasure. Wonderful um, to see you. Welcome to King's. I'll thank just you. start by, you know, with a brief introduction. You don't really need introduction. But uh, Josh Engrist is a professor of economics at MIT. And we met about 20 years ago when I did my PhD and you were my supervisor. I uh, remember it well. <laughs> <laughs> Josh won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2000, uh, 2021. We were joined with uh, David Card and Guido Imbans. Uh, and I was so pleased with, with the news. Um, and you were a very good supervisor, very inspiring, and Thank an you. excellent teacher as well, as a brilliant researcher. So I'm, I'm very pleased that you are here um, with us today. Uh, so I have some questions to ask you. So you, your Nobel Prize was for your uh, contributions to methods for studying causal effects in mm -hmm. economics. What has inspired you to look at causality in economics? Well, I got interested in that as a graduate student. Um, I don't think I, you know, when you go to graduate school, it's all kind of unclear what you'll do and you're a blank slate. You know, you're absorbing different sorts of material, you're taking classes in theory and econometrics and, uh, and then applied courses. But I had some focus when I went to graduate school. I knew I wanted to study labor economics with Orly Ashenfelter who had invited me to Princeton, where I did my PhD. And very quickly, I got interested in work that other graduate students were doing on causal effects. Orly was one of the first people to study the effects of training programs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, These are programs that uh, provide additional skills and training for disadvantaged workers, usually government-funded, sometimes a mix of public and private money. And Orley was very interested. He was probably the first uh, economist to study this systematically in uh, how to measure the causal effects of these programs. And he was surrounded by a group of talented graduate students who uh, shared his interest. I guess we were really just inspired by him. And uh, one of those students uh, was named Robert Lalonde, Bob Lalonde. And he had done a remarkable thesis showing that it would be very hard to evaluate uh, training programs accurately to get their causal effect, that is to measure the difference in earnings between those who were trained and what their earnings would have been without the training, that, that you need a randomized trial to do that. And so that was Bob's thesis. And I remember being so excited by that kind of question. And I thought, well, I would have been happy to write that thesis. So I wanted to do something similar. And uh, Orly was a fount of ideas along those lines at that time. And at some point he suggested to our class, it was a graduate class in labor economics, that somebody should use the draft lottery to estimate the effects of military service on veterans' earnings. And he just walked into class one day and said he saw somebody do something like that for health, for mortality. And he said, somebody should do that for earnings. And I said, yes, I will do that. And I went and went to the library and I started working on that uh, in 1987. And that's what I've been doing ever since. So he gave you the idea for your he get, PhD? He did, he did, absolutely. Jesus. And I like to tell my students, you know, that success in economics is not about having good ideas, it's just about recognizing them. Yes. Yeah, very good. Um, so if you could give some advice to students who would like to do a PhD in economics, what would you say to them? Well, actually, I often try to discourage people from doing a PhD in economics because I don't think it's for everybody. You know, you really have to be committed to it. It's not enough to be bright and hardworking. You, you have to really love the material. So it, it's not, you know, it, it, successful economists, I think if you look at the most successful scholars in our discipline, you know, people like David Card and Guido Imbens, who are my co-laureates, and my very successful MIT colleagues like Esther Duflo, who was my student, and won the prize with Abhijit Banerjee a couple years ago. You know, it's, uh, it's more than a job for these folks and for me. You know, they're sort of on a mission. You're, you're inspired to show the world something. It doesn't have to be what I do, but it has to be something that really excites you mm -hmm. and uh, that you're willing to spend a lot of time on. And you also have to have a very high tolerance for failure. Many of our ideas don't work out. I would say most of them aren't very successful. So you have to be able to kind of pick yourself up from a lot of failure and hope that you get a good project that produces an exciting paper mm -hmm. every now and then. Does it get easier to cope with failure over time? Or 
It gets easier in the sense that it's, you develop a, a sort of a, an expectation mm -hmm. and you, know, you observe that over time you'll fail a lot and then once in a while you succeed. I think there's a sort of an, an adaptive period early in a scholar's career where you know, some hard lessons have to be learned. Uh, it doesn't ever get fun to fail. Mm -hmm. You know, when I have grant proposals rejected and papers rejected, and it's still the case that most of my grant proposals and most of my papers are rejected. Uh, I don't think I have a higher hit rate today than I did 30 years ago. Uh, that's never fun. It's always disappointing, but you learn to move on. Yeah, very good. I guess after you get tenure, maybe it's a bit less, less pressure. It's a little bit less pressure, but successful scholars are motivated by, you know, the desire to do scholarship and to, mm -hmm. to have their work read. Yeah. So not just by tenure. Of course, yeah. it's wonderful to get tenure. We're lucky that we get lifetime employment. Not many people get that. But if you want to be influential in your field, you have to keep working. Yeah. So how do you choose your research questions? Do you choose them on the basis of the question itself or the methodology? Well, it's a mix, mm. uh, but um, I, I love econometric ideas and I love to apply them in my work. I don't think of myself as a theorist. I try not to work on things where I don't have in mind an empirical question mm -hmm. that I think is relevant for um, public policy, or maybe it's just relevant for other scholars. Maybe the community that's going to read that work is my peer labor economists, but I don't know. There has to be an important question for me to feel like something's worthwhile, an important applied economics question. Mm -hmm. What uh, I'm lucky is uh, I've sort of found uh, the interface between interesting questions and a, a burgeoning literature in econometrics that's developing tools to answer uh, mostly policy relevant causal effects. And I got into that very early. It's hard to believe, I think, for young scholars today, but there was a time when, you know, economists didn't know about regression discontinuity designs and differences and differences was a new idea for us. Uh, and in the early 90s, that those ideas began to be seen as very useful. And then there was this flowering of methodological work uh, designed to make these ideas more useful. And my piece of that was the work on instrumental variables with Hido Imbens. Mm -hmm. And that was very much a, a back and forth between empirical work and methods. So uh, Hido and I really set out in 1990 when I first met him. I was an assistant professor at Harvard and he came one year later. We only overlapped for one year. We used to do our laundry together. And we'd sit, we didn't have, we, we lived in subsidized Harvard housing and we'd sit in the basement of my building, which was where the laundry machines were, coin operated machines. And we'd watch our clothes spin and talk about econometrics. And the idea that captivated us was how to interpret and evaluate instrumental variable strategies like the draft lottery in the Rubin causal model, the Rubin potential outcomes framework which at the time was new to econometrics. Mm -hmm. And we found that both captivating and challenging. We worked for a while without any solution for that. And then we came up with the late theorem. Mm. But if you thought about a research question that is important, policy relevant, but you couldn't think about a causal method to apply to the question, would you write a paper on it? Sometimes, you know, I, I also, I tell students, you don't have to write the best paper possible you only have to improve on what's been done. So, you know, some problems are very challenging and there's no good natural experiments, uh, or at least nobody's thought of that yet. Um, but you might still write a paper about that and, you know, produce a very influential contribution. Uh, a great example of that is uh, Alan Kruger's work with Stacy Dale on the effects of going to a more selective university. Yes. Uh, there's uh, two wonderful papers. I built, I built a whole section of my textbook around mm -hmm. Dale and Kruger 2002. And Stacy and Allen had the insight that, you know, if you knew where people applied to college, you could control for that. And mm -hmm. that eliminates a lot of the selection bias. Yeah. And if you know where they get in, then you kind of have a good measure of their ability. Mm -hmm. They don't have an instrument. There's no discontinuity. You know, there's no sort of 
total killer identification strategy there, but there is a, a very powerful idea and it turns out to be very useful. Yes. I teach that to my students, by the it's way. It's a great paper. <laughs> when I teach regression. Yes, but that's they, how I teach regression as well. Yeah, but they have very good data, right? So that's what makes well, it. Well, that, that, Alan, I think, figured out that the College and Beyond data set would allow you to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very, very good use of data. Um, and as we are talking about causality, so there are fields like you mentioned Esther Duflo. So mm -hmm. in development economics, they really use these methods and take them very seriously in labor economics as well. But in fields like macroeconomics, we don't see that so much. Well, we don't see it as much. Yeah. No, we start to see more some examples. Yes. Yeah. Why do you think this is the case with macro? Um, well, first of all, you, you do see more and more. So you see interesting papers uh, uh, that are built around quasi-experimental variation in fiscal policy and taxes, and sometimes even in monetary policy. But um, And uh, Christine and David Romer were, were pioneers of sort of that, that approach to monetary policy, though they didn't quite do it the way uh, applied microeconomists would do. I, I tried to adapt their work in a series of papers with Guido Kirsteiner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one issue is that the problems are harder in the sense that there are probably fewer natural experiments. And even when they do occur, there's, they're in a time series context, so there's no obvious control. You know, the Fed uh, in the United States just raised the interest rate 0.75, you know, 75 basis points instead of 50. And that was kind of surprising. So that sounds like a natural experiment, mm -hmm. but it's not clear what's the control group for that yeah. <laughs> event. You know, uh, maybe it's the UK or Canada, but then that's only a couple countries. So, um, so the problems are hard. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one reason why I think the methods have been slower to percolate in macro. But I think there's also a, an intellectual tradition that leans more heavily on structural modeling and mm -hmm. so sort of this idea that we have an understanding of how the macro economy works. I think that's kind of a conceit, uh, but they're definitely skilled practitioners, uh, you know, uh, who, who use that mm -hmm. in their work. Very good. So I think this is all we have time for okay. today. And Great I look forward to it. It was very nice talking to you. Um, and uh, thank you very much for coming. My pleasure. Thank you.